Good evening to all of you. Uh, Patochka Memorial Lecture 2023. My name is uh, Ludger Hagedon. I'm a permanent fellow here at the Institute for Human Sciences. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Institute, also on behalf of our rector, Misha Glenny, who unfortunately fell sick and cannot be with us tonight, but is uh, sending his regards uh, to all of you. Let me also extend a very special welcome to Shalini Randeria, <laughs> who is here in the first row. Uh, Shalini now uh, 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 serving as r rector and president of CEU and former being the rector of this institution until like two years ago, right Shalini? <laughs> right. <laughs> very warm welcome to all of you for this lecture, Patochka Memorial Lecture. This is the flagship annual lecture of uh, the Institute. This year we see its 34th edition. Already this number in itself, I think, is impressive and means something in, something in itself. It tells us about uh, uh, the continuity of this lecture, about the initial mission that it had and that we have carried on for uh, such a long time. In the invitation that most of you will have seen, you could also see uh, some of the names of the very famous speakers uh, who in the past uh, we have invited uh, for this format of the Patochka Memorial Lecture. I will not go into this because it would be mere name dropping and I think this is not uh, very much in the spirit of this evening. But I would want to make one exception and this one exception is to mention a former speaker of the symbolic year 2000. And this former speaker, I'd also like to mention in honor of our speaker of tonight, who is a Polish speaker, and this speaker in the year 2000 was also a Polish speaker, that was the Nobel, Nobel laureate uh, Czesław Miłosz, who gave the Patochka Memorial Lecture that year. And my fatal relationship with this institute is already so long <laughs> that I have to say that I even remember being there <laughs> 23 years ago. <laughs> uh, I do not remember much of what was said that evening, but I remember being there and I remember that Miwos was reading, what do you expect, I mean we have a Nobel Prize laureate, he was reading his poems, but I'm sure that uh, Krzysztof Michalski, the founding rector of this institute, also got him into some discussion on Czesław Miwos's role as a public intellectual, on his role as an emigree, you know he was one of the very famous, one of the very many, one of the very famous Polish emigrees, and about his um, um, role as an intellectual for society. And this reminded me of the fact that just a few uh, days ago I organized uh, an event on Czesław Miłosz uh, on the seven, 70th anniversary of the publication of his breakthrough book. This was The Captive Mind. Later on he became much more known as a poet, but The Captive Mind was really his br international breakthrough. And in this book, Captive Mind, he's very much speaking about the role of intellectuals and about the the fact that power, and especially totalitarian power, he's speaking about Stalinist Poland very much in this book, uh, about the, the, the seductions that totalitarian power has for intellectuals. And he portrays four intellectuals who, according to his uh, uh, view, I would say, who went, who took on the wrong path. Uh, though he's not condemning him, I think it's a very open-minded book and it's a book of very much of understanding. But he himself, I think, is the representative of another example of maybe ke keeping a clearer uh, moral stance towards this totalitarian lure. And the other person of tonight that we are commemorating with this lecture is Jan Patochka, the Czech philosopher, who died in 1977 uh, in the context of formulating Charter 77. And when Czesław Miwosz published his breakthrough book in 1953, it also happened to be the year of Stalin's death. So you have the politi political caesura of that year and you also have this intellectual caesura of that year because really after Miwosz's book, our view and especially also those of the Western intellectuals changed drastically. And the big sy sympathy that Soviet communism still had to very many intellectuals in the West changed drastically. And in that same year when Miwosh published this book, 1953, 
Kotochka tried to go another way. He tried to hide in the Academy of Sciences, Czech Academy of Sciences. Our speaker of tonight is also working at the Polish Academy of Sciences. He tried to hide at the Academy of Sciences, and those of you who know these academies, and especially who know the big, big academies in the socialist countries at that time, you know there is a good chance to hide in that kind of academies and their, their complex structures. Patochka tried to hide there, uh, working on the history of ideas for many years, and quite successfully so, he, he, he could hide there. But at some point, this very same question uh, that Miwosh was answering with, with his book was also coming to him, namely, what is your relationship to the power? Do you want to get engaged politically or not? Rather reluctantly, Patochka got engaged in the year 1977, but once he had to taken over that burden, he did it quite willingly, he did it quite consciously, and really with a big of with, with, with a lot of generosity and with a big heart, I would say, and with a lot of courage. And this, I think, is very much also the spirit that not only <laughs> is behind these lectures that we do annually, but also it was very much the founding spirit and the founding mission of uh, this institution that is behind you. So having said that, this is, was the short introduction for the lecture as such. We couldn't be any happier, uh, uh, Darius Stoller, than to have you tonight as the speaker of tonight. Darius Stoller is a historian, as I already said, working at the Polish Academy, PAN, Polish Academy of Sciences, at the Institute of Political Studies. His area of expertise is modern and 20th century um, history, especially all questions of Polish-Jewish um, relations and of the Holocaust. Um, and, and this brings me already closer to the topic of tonight, and of Poland's post-war communist regime. Much of his work is also dedicated to the uh, very important and uh, today ever more important topic of migration. This he will also uh, reflect on a bit in his talk of tonight. Darius used to be, was the director of Polin uh, from 2014 to 2019. Polin is the museum of the history um, of Polish Jews. Darius Stoller has published uh, 10 books, more than 150 articles. I will not enumerate books, I will not enumerate articles, forgive me ab about uh, that. Um, he also, in his uh, function at the Polish Academy uh, of Sciences, he also serves on the Academy's Committee on History and on the con Committee on Migra Migration Research. And beyond that is on the advisory board of several Polish and international institutions. And among these institutions where he's serving on the board, there is one that I should mention especially, namely this is IWM, our institute, where he is on the board of trustees and serves currently as the vice president of the board of tr trustees. Darius, we are very, very happy to have you here for this lecture. We are very happy to have you on our board of trustees and we are very happy to have you here for the lecture tonight. Your talk is entitled Agency of the Powerless, and Darius, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this generous introduction. It's a great and, I must confess, completely unexpected honor for me to, to deliver the, this year Patochka lecture to you. And uh, let me begin with uh, Václav Havel, famous to say, the power of the powerless, it's hidden in the title of my lecture, especially as, as this essay Havel dedicated to the memory of Jan Patochka. He published uh, the, the essay the year after Patochka's uh, uh, dramatic death. So I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a good beginning. And uh, because you have m mentioned uh, Czesław Miłosz and his uh, the early book on, on the captive minds, uh, I believe that still the communist regimes deserve attention uh, and uh, intellectual effort to understand them. Uh, for my students, it's a very distant past. Uh, uh, almost as distant as the Second World War was to me. I just realized recently that in, in terms of years, it's, it's as distant. But I think it requires some effort. I would like to propose to you a certain perspective 
on the communist regime and, uh, and specifically on the margins of the communist regime and not on the intellectuals. I, I'm not going to follow Czesław uh, Miłosz, uh, but rather the other end of the uh, specter of spectrum of education and social status, very ordinary people not the ordinary people as the populists define them in opposition to the, to the intellectual elite, but ordinary people who are usually far away from any structures of, of, of power. But let me start with, with uh, Havas' essay. Uh, he presented the iconic figure of the Greensgrosser in Prague, who puts the slogan, workers of the world unite in the windows of his shop between the carrots and the apples. Uh, he most likely doesn't believe the slogan. He doesn't care about the unity of the workers of the world. And Havels analyzes the meaning of, of his action and tells that the meaning is obedience, the fear. I am obedient. I am afraid, and I will do what you tell me to do. And you are, is, the, is the Communist Party of, of, of Czechoslovakia. So this is not a sign of solidarity. And the essay unveils the daily reproduction of the communist regime, the praxis of the, of the communist rule, uh, which was a participatory dictatorship, as a German historian named it quite adequately, when uh, millions of the subjects of the regime were performing loyal citizens. And it's actually not so relevant did they really believe it or not, were they really loyal or weren't. They behaved as if they were loyal which uh, Jacek Kuroń, another great analyst of the communist regime, realized at a moment and say, why don't you believe as if you were free? So uh, uh, pretending to be someone makes you someone in the end. And in fact, this is not unique to the communist regime. All political regimes require the, the daily reproduction by people. No state can exist without the social practices of reproduction. These practices, especially the routine practices, uh, enact the state, which otherwise probably does not exist. You know, at 5 a.m. in the morning, when the police officer on duty falls asleep, probably the state ceases to exist because there is no one to enact it at this given moment. Uh, even the symbols of the most solid, the most solid expressions of the state existence, the buildings, you know royal palaces, the palaces of ministries, police stations, prisons, are actually scenes to perform the state. And if there are no police officers, if there are no prisoners and guards, no minister or no monarchs, the state, maybe they exist in the absolute sense, but they don't operate. So uh, I would like to, uh, uh, this is especially clear to someone who saw it. And I was the eyewitness of the building of the Polish Communist Party headquarters, turning into the seat of the Warsaw Stock Exchange within a year. It was a symbolic revenge of Adam Smith against Karl Marx, certainly. <laughs> but I also saw the buildings of the Soviet military barracks in northern Poland, which first were abandoned and then became just residential buildings. So the, not only the function, the meaning changed. And for my students, the building which still stands at the corner of uh, Aleje Jerozolimskie, uh, uh, the, the Communist uh, Party headquarters doesn't have the meaning it still has for me. I always think about it as the headquarters of the Communist Party, but it, for them it's no longer. So uh, when Havel exposed to what extent the communist regime, the uh, communist regime of the really existing socialism, the late communist regime, the post-Stalin communist regime, relied on lies, he pointed at the potential of the regime demise. If the greengrocer or anybody else decides not to repeat the lies, to live in truth, as uh, Havel called it, the regime will simply implode. The regime will not exist without certain performances. And other people, I have mentioned Jacek Kuron. Jacek Kuron actually developed ways to make such small acts of disobedience, the small acts of rebellion, spread in the hope that in fortunate circumstances they will reach a critical mass and force the regime to change. And actually, it did happen. In Poland, it happened two years after the publication of the Havel's essay in the summer of 1980. Suddenly, millions of people started to obey as if they were free. And this way, they, they made the, the solidarity union. Uh, later on, this capacity of the small acts of disobedience to make big politics attracted the attention of scholars. And let me mention uh, Jeffrey Goldfarb, who wrote a beautiful book about the politics of small things, beginning with the alternative theater in Poland. 
And uh, Goldfarb in turn benefited from Erving Goffman's understanding of everyday practices as a theater, the presentation of self in everyday life. In our case, this is the presentation of self as citizens, loyal citizens like the Green Grocer or disloyal citizens of the, of the communist state. Uh, uh, and let me stress that the, the Green Grocer's uh, behavior is spectacular. It's for a show. It's to make others see that he has put on display the slogan. And this way, the communist state was communicating to its citizens that everybody is supporting the state, so or any opposition doesn't make sense. In this, uh, from this perspective, we can see that the citizens of the communist state, especially party members or those in, in the managerial positions, were both actors on the socialist scenes and audience. They were displaying something for others to see, the act of obedience, and others were watching them and thinking, Everybody supports the government. So that was a very avant-garde theater when the line between the audience and the scene was blurred, but it was quite effective through most of the period. And let me stress it that it looks like uh, Havel wrote it only in 1978 and Polish solidarity started in the 1980, which means it was more than three decades after the imposition of the communist rule in Central and Eastern Europe. So it was largely effective throughout the, the first 30 years. Uh, of course, the roles were not uh, equal. Some people in this big theater of communist states had supervisory roles. They were to supervise others and possibly punish anyone who disobeyed. Uh, there were people who were writing the script for the for the, for the spectacle, and I like very much the term script or screenplay, especially as Hanna Świdaziemba, a Polish sociologist, introduced it in her analysis of, of the communist regime. And this is an all-encompassing script, script on all aspects of life, which formally was written by the founders, you know, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin later on, slightly modified, but there is a very narrow group to interpret the script, and everybody else is to obey it. There is no one which is not allowed to, to obey it, and this is a, a, a part of, of it. And deviation from the script was, was punished to varying degree and, and with varying severity. And I would like to extend this way of thinking, which Havel proposed and, and Golfar described later on, to intentionally apolitical acts, to acts of people who have no ambitions to emancipate themselves, to change their regime, to liberate Czechoslovakia or Poland from anything. Uh, they were motivated not so much by Havel's noble desire to live in truth, but the desire to live in a bigger flat, or a desire to buy a car, or a desire to buy a bicycle for, for their children. Uh, but I stress this very earthly reasons, very everyday reasons, but economy is never just a way to satisfy material needs. People make money not just to have money, but it's a sign of status, to feel agency, uh, maybe to compensate for, 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 for some ideas about themselves. So I, I stress it that even the people who wanted to buy a bigger flat or a bicycle or a coat, maybe they were expressing their desire for agency, for independence, for social status, or from, for the freedom from poverty. And, and I leave it, leave it because for me, human beings are black boxes. And let me narrow this presentation to a subfield of the field of the economy. Economy for the communists was important. They believe that economic relations is the basis on which the superstructure of the political regime is built. And they treated it seriously, especially in the Stalin era. Anyone who wanted to behave in the market relations was a speculator. And speculation meant being an objective agent of capitalism. And that was serious. There were people, you know, seriously punished. And I have read a number of Polish Stalinists who demanded death penalty for speculation. So they treated this seriously. Later on, it somehow was blurred, like many other things. But uh, the, I think this initial stress on, on economic relations was, was important. In the post-Stalin era, the, the Soviet Tau and the reforms that followed in, in most of Central and Eastern Europe gave the regime some more flexibility. It greatly reduced terror. It allowed for a modicum of private sphere. And among others, they extended the toleration for small private business. Precarious, 
supervised by state bureaucrats, but it was a small business which was no longer on a death row, which wasn't expected to disappear within, within five years, at least initially was. And it had a strange capacity to expand into the gray zones. And we have nice studies how the second economy in Hungary, for example, emerged, or in Poland. But between the legal second economy and the official socialist economy, there were large zones of the gray sphere when it wasn't clear, is it legal or not? It could have been legal today, but illegal tomorrow, and maybe legal again in a year from now. And I would like to, to, to focus on, 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 on a subfield of this field of grain economic zones, which comes from my field of research. My field of research is international mobility, migration, and I have spent many years digging through the archives of the Polish Communist Party and Polish Security Service to understand it better. Uh, and uh, so the reasons are practical, I know it, but also migrants, the people I studied, were very ordinary people, especially when something is massive. People who participate in mass phenomena are ordinary people by definition statistically. Uh, and moreover, they didn't have political motivation. Those who wanted to emigrate for good, especially to Germany or to Israel or to the United States, may have had some political motivation. But those who are going abroad just for a few weeks to work in Austria or to buy and sell things in Bulgaria, they usually didn't have political motivation. I mean, and they didn't want to change the regime. They wanted to go around the regime. Avoid the regime in a sense, avoid the script that was imposed on them for very personal reasons. And I believe that evasion is much more important in understanding of the communist regime than a resistance and opposition. Certainly it was much more widespread and I suppose it may have been also very consequential, but we, we need to see it. Uh, the, the, the violent behavior in the international mobility is also a good case to study because it almost disappeared in the early 1950s. In the high Stalin years, there was almost no international mobility between the communist states, other than the movement of party apparatchiks and the military. So really very few. And then we can, so we can watch the emergence of a phenomenon and then its expansion and its evolution and what happens after. And I will give you a, a, a nice example because in Poland, the short-term mobility abroad started with the mobility to the Soviet Union. It started because as a part of the post-Stalin reforms, Soviet authorities announced in 1955 that they are simplifying and easing the requirements for visits by the citizens of the socialist states, visits to the Soviet Union. So Polish press praised the reforms of the Soviet Union because it praised everything that was happening in the Soviet Union. And the officers at the passport office were surprised that suddenly thousands of people started to apply. Who were those people? The initial, those who applied initially, were mostly the Poles who had been expelled from the territories annexed to the Soviet Union, like the today's Ukrainian city of Lviv, which was Lviv up, up to the 1939. And they were just longing to see their family members, their homes, which they had left a decade before. So the motivation was far from making any money. It was very personal and very emotional. And between 1954 uh, and 55, it grew 27 times, from only 400 people, only 400 Poles visited Soviet Union in 1954, to 11,000 in 55, and then to 156,000 in 1956. So again, 14 times. You had an explosion of migration. And while the initial motivation was very personal and emotional, these people realize that crossing the border, they can buy things unavailable in Poland, like Soviet watches, or bicycles, or radio sets, at a much better price that they, they could buy. So uh, consumption products inavailable, consumer products inavailable in Poland, or much more expensive they were buying. And some of them realize it makes not only emotional sense to go to the Soviet Union, so they try to repeat the trip or encourage family and friends and relatives to do the same and advise them what to do. So very quickly, uh, uh, Polish and Soviet custom officers were complaining about the pathologies of the tourist movement, as they call it. And the Soviets, within a year, changed their mind about the visits of foreigners, including socialist foreigners, though they made the, the, uh, the restrictions grow again. However, 
In the meantime, other communist states like Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and Hungary followed the Soviet pattern and facilitated entry regulation to these countries. So within 1960s, we see systematic expansion of the phenomenon of travel abroad. So in the late 60s, almost half a million times Poles were going abroad to socialist states, which was actually the same regime which decreased international mobility almost zero in the early 50s, made it possible to deliver, which didn't exist at any moment before. And again, it was despite the repeated complaints by the custom offices about the pathologies. And the pathologies were buying shoes in Germany, vinyl discs in Budapest, or selling sunglasses in Bulgaria in exchange for something, which I don't remember anymore. But it was highly profitable. That means even if someone was caught at the border and lost the commodity, the profit from the previous trip still paid for, still paid for it. So uh, by conservative estimates of the custom officers themselves, I have calculated that in the 1960s, between 100,000 and 200,000 trips annually were primarily for petty trade. In the 1970s, between a million and two, because in the 1970s the mobility exploded, Poles went abroad 10 million times annually, mostly to East Germany. And in the peak year, 1989, probably more than five million times Poles went abroad. And I stress times, not people, because some people did it 10 times, and some people only once. But it means that thousands, then hundreds of thousands, and eventually millions of the citizens of communist Poland were engaging in something which was very unsocialist. Not just a socialist. It was unsocialist because it was market operation. They were the objective agents of capitalism. And the invisible hand rewarded them very generously. I know it because I did it. <laughs> I did sell my sunglasses in Romania on my hiking trip in 1986. It was an excellent deal. I didn't sell my blue jeans in Lviv. At that time, I somehow forgot to take this other part of uh, trousers to come back to Poland and something. <laughs> uh, and I'm also an exhibit for another story, the story of the labor migration. Especially in the 1970s, uh, the Polish government liberalized the uh, regulations regarding visits to the West. And Poles started going massively to the West, including to this country, and take short-term labor. Usually just a few weeks, sometimes a few months. But in the case of the United States, it was longer. And it was highly profitable. So coming back with the Aust Austrian shillings or Deutschmarks or American dollars, made you a millionaire in Poland, and I know it. Uh, because when in 1987 I was a waiter in New York, on a good day I could earn $100 on a 12-hour shift. At that time, my father, who was a civil engineer, was earning equivalent of $30 monthly. So my revenue was 60 times higher than his. When I returned back to Poland, I was a millionaire for a short time, unfortunately. <laughs> So it was highly attractive. You can later on ask me, how is it possible that the black market exchange rate of dollar was so high? Because there is an, uh, an answer to this. But for me, it's secondary. It's important that m thousands and then millions of people had experience of selling their labor on capitalist markets. And they were not afraid of capitalist markets anymore. And I think understanding the readiness of Poles to accept very radical reforms, economic reforms, 1989, 1990, has to do with this massive experience among of us. Uh, let me mention some patterns of this uh, expansion. But first, uh, two more things. For many people, in my case, these Polish tourists or labor migrants, Earnings from abroad made a substantial, if not the major part, of the annual revenue. Few of them withdrew from the socialist economy. It made sense to make, have a job in Poland, which also meant insurance, you know, health insurance and so on, and extend your vacations. But they were no longer, for them, the Communist Party was no longer the main dispenser of desirable goods. Houses, cars, shoes fancy clothing, that means these are not only consumer goods, they are signs of status, social status. And I think it undermined the Communist Party position, its monopolistic position, as the distributor of the most valuable goods. Uh, second, if we go back to the metaphor of the communist regime as a script, 
we may say that the principle of the regime was to make the state the only scene in town, especially in the economy, that only an etatized economy was to operate. If they tolerated on the margins something which was not owned by the state, it was tolerated and on the margins. However, the expanding black markets and gray markets and other colored markets, because there were different kinds of markets with different colors, <laughs> meant that these were alternative scenes. I mean, literally, people were acting as petty traders or labor migrants outside of the official economy, which means outside of the, of the official scene. So, uh, the plastic people of the universe in, in Czechoslovakia, or the rock bands in Poland, or the Grotowski Theater in Poland, they were literally making alternative scenes. But we can see such scenes not only in arts and culture. We can see such scenes in the economics, and eventually, people like Havel and Kuron and Michnik were making such scenes for civic engagement. And I think that was the novelty. Not just making a, an alternative scene, but making specifically a political scene for, for the people. Uh, and the experience of making money outside of the socialist economy, be it in a capitalist market or in the gray market or in a black market, means outside of the, of the formal economy, contributed to the redefinition of the situation. They understood situation differently. And also they could think differently about the economy. It was no longer the economy. Socialist economy was a economy they knew. And again, if you go back to 1989, I think, there were many people who are not afraid of this kind of economy, who thought, OK, I know how to make it. This is not completely new to me. Uh, let me mention two aspects of the expansion of this unsocialist practices. First was the beginning. There was someone at the beginning of it, as I said. This person from Lviv or from somewhere in Western Ukraine or in Lithuania who wanted to visit his relatives who remained there and then became the first Polish petty trader. Uh, I have found in security archives a report from the Israeli legation from January 1955 when Israeli diplomats made a party. They drank heavily because a woman got exit permit, a single woman. And they were right. That was the beginning of liberalization of the exit policy for the immigrants to, 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 to Israel, Jewish immigrants. So the single woman, when she applied, she didn't know she will be successful. She could have expected that her application would be rejected, and she was facing a serious risk of getting under the watchful eye of the security office. So for example, less and less people applied for passports in the 1950s because it wasn't reasonable. The uh, likelihood of getting a passport was almost nil, and the probability of attracting attention of the security office was high. So these pioneers, they took a risk, and usually they had a strong personal motivation to take the risk. But they had followers. Why? Because the news of their success spread quickly along the social networks. Gossip, rumors, that was the alternative communication system, and it existed. The communists made great efforts to kill alternative communication systems. You know, that was a crime to tell jokes, for example, at the moment, but then they gave up. And everywhere in communist countries you have alternative communication systems, not always reliable, but they existed. And these alternative communication systems direct us to the role of the networks. Friends, neighbors, relative people you know, uh, sociologists call these uh, networks social capital. They follow Bourdieu, who realized that there is not only economic capital, you may have social capital, you may have cultural capital, the skills that you have, for example. And I think you cannot un overestimate the role of these non-economic capitals in communist countries. Why? Because the communists did not read Bourdieu. They have destroyed the capacity to accumulate economic capital. It was very difficult to have more money. Well, you could dig in your garden and put some gold coins, but that was it. But it was unrestricted to accumulate social capital. Whom do you know? Who is your brother-in-law? With whom did you study? With whom did you do your military service? So uh, there were many things you could do in communist countries only 
with your connections. And the joke from Soviet Union was, what is the worst punishment in the Soviet Union? 10 years without connections. You're nobody in this sense. And it shows the value of the, of the social uh, capital. Uh, the spread of the unsocialist practices of, of the migrants and tourists had the dynamics of an epidemics. And with people who emigrated completely, it's a one-time event, you leave. But for those who are coming back and going abroad and selling something and working in Vienna and going back, we can see something more, an evolution. That means the gradual development of the new forms of doing the same things. At the beginning, it was only one way of doing these things. Then there were 10 ways of doing this thing. And this epidemic dynamics, which is very well known to us just three years after the, uh, the COVID, uh, was something that the highly centralized commerce regime had problems to tackle. For example, a, a migrant who actually worked in, in Vienna in 1980s, when he returned to Warsaw, went to the passport office to return his passport, and the security officer started yelling on him and told him, you must write a detailed report. What did you do abroad the last three months? He overstayed. But he did a very simple thing. He said, of course, yes, I will. And he came next day when another officer was on duty. And this other officer didn't demand him to write the report. Why did he do it? Because he learned it from a friend, a very simple trick, how to avoid a potential uh, retortion. So again, we go back to the network of friends and families and how knowledge was spreading in it. And in this way, you have an evolutionary mechanism a network of highly mobile people, people who communicate, people who exchange good practices against the highly centralized state. So clearly, the traders had an advantage, and they were gradually moving, expanding the fields of operation. Uh, why Havel, Kuron, and other strategists of the politics of small things only marginally mention the non-political behavior, mostly economics acts, as I have presented today. I suppose they were right when they focus on practices and routines like the greengrocers putting the slogan on display, because such acts had only one function, to maintain the existence of the regime. There was no other reason to put the slogan in the window than the maintenance of the communist regime. So the capacity to subvert something which was, had one function and apparently was necessary for the regime. The regime wanted, the people who enacted the regime wanted it. That was the soft underbelly of the regime. The transgressions in the economic sphere were much more ambiguous. As I said, people were making money for a variety of reasons. Also, people who are party members were doing it. Again, let me stress the perspective of the roles. One could be a party member of a police officer between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. and just a father, a husband, a philatelist, or a lover of uh, Hungarian rock bands who goes abroad to buy vinyl discs. And the only way for him to buy a vinyl disc is to sell something when in Budapest. So people may have different roles. The most beautiful example is uh, the man who at the moment was the first secretary of the Polish Communist Party, Mr. Rakowski, who was writing a diary. And when martial law started in Poland in December 1981, he buried his diary in the garden. So when he, between 8 a.m. and late afternoon, he was a party activist, one of the leaders, members of the Central Committee. But in the evening, he was the author of his diary, hiding from the state that he was enacting during the day. So people may have different roles. And as the gray markets and the black markets were alternative scenes for economic activity, people could operate on several scenes. And that was also undermining the regime, because the regime had only the capacity to control the state on scene. He could, it couldn't control other scenes. However, there was this ambiguity in it, namely, you may have a very good dictatorship with a market economy. You actually, you may have a single party dictatorship with a mostly market economy. Please go to China. So there is no contradiction. The, 
there was a contradiction between living in truth and the communist regime in Czechoslovakia or Poland. And Havel saw it, and Miknik saw it, and Kuroń saw it, and others. But there is no essential contradiction between single party dictatorship and the market economy. So I think the, the fact that Havel only marginally mentions that his colleague from the brewery lost his job because it just he wanted to make a good beer. Okay? But that was marginal. Uh, moreover, some people who exploited their social capital uh, in, in communist regimes had very good positions in the party or were relatives of people in good positions in the party. Think only about the family of comrade Brezhnev. Right? So they were combining the best of the two worlds, exploiting the privileges of the position and being protected as a member of an important family and exploiting their social capital, their skills they, they had. So this is the ambiguity. However, while the single party dictatorship can coexist with a market economy, as we see, this is no longer the kind of rule that Stalin or Mao or Brezhnev enjoyed. This is authoritarian rule, but this is not the rule of Joseph Stalin. And uh, the powerless subjects of communist dictators, by the cumulative efforts, by the effort of petty trade, when a single act of petty trade is by definition petty, is really small. So for a custom officer or for a border guard, it's too small to waste your attention to prevent it. But when you have million people doing it, it's no longer petty trade. It's oxymoronic. You cannot have petty trade by million people. And that was the power of the powerless multiplied by first thousands and millions. They were changing the nature of the regime slowly, not necessarily into a liberal democracy, but certainly away from the communist dictatorship as it was founded by Joseph Stalin. Thank you for your attention. So Darius, thank you for uh, this uh, fascinating talk and also for like the journey that you did with us, uh, taking us with you to New York when you were working as a waiter there and taking us on the journeys of very, very many other Polish people of that time, uh, of the whole period between the 1950s and the 1980s. Fascinating numbers, the explosion of traveling that you presented uh, to us. Uh, thank you also very much of uh, building it into the spirit of uh, <laughs> the name giver of this lecture, uh, um, of the background of, of Patechka and, and Havel. I will start um, with two questions to you. And we decided this is a festive lecture, this is the Patechka Memorial Lecture. We will not make it a long interrogation, we will make it a rather short Q&A. Darius, you agreed uh, happily to have a short Q&A, so we can also have a, a, a few questions from the audience later on, get prepared for that, and then we will go down f to have a wine and cheese downstairs, and then you can continue your conversation, your personal conversations with Darius um, downstairs. Darius, I take up your metaphor that was somewhat central to your talk. This metaphor is the metaphor of a script or of a screenplay. You said the communist, uh, we can understand the communist regime as a script or a screenplay. And what it does is it sets, as you say, rules and roles. It gives rules and roles. And uh, the individual people, they are faced with the question what to do with these rules and roles. They can observe the rules. Most often they decide to observe the rules. You have given us the starting example of uh, uh, Václav Havel and the greengrocer, who maybe even over fulfills the rules out of, out of fear. You can accept the rules. You can try to go around the rules a bit. And regarding roles, you have your role assigned. You will play that role, probably you have no alternative to play that role. You can maybe not step, step out, but you can try to play alternative roles. You have an official role playing at the Book Theater, and you have an unofficial role playing here tonight, just for a very small uh, audience. Um, and I think this is very much what you tell us, what, what, the, the, what was the strategy of people. 
I will start with one very simple question and then I will have a second one related to that. If, if we take this, this metaphor of the rules and roads and how people relate, relate to it, you presented it to us uh, um, that um, um, uh, this, this was people's individual decisions. What about the state? What about the state order? How much did the state know about it? And how, in how far did the state willingly accept it? Uh, because it is, I mean, it is very clear that there was an awareness of what was going on, and in how far was it maybe even beneficial for the state? I mean, trade, mutual trade, uh, is to mutual benefit normally, and not only for the individuals, maybe also for the state. Let's start with that question. So uh, clearly, the state, I mean, the leaders of the state, because when you say the communist state, we always must be more specific about who is it. Is it the, you know, the police officer on duty at 5, 4 a.m. or a member of the Politburo? So clearly, there was an awareness of it, uh, but it was always delayed. It was al almost always they were behind the new developments. And I think this capacity for individuals to do things that are unexpected, especially unexpected by, by members of the Politburo and the ministers and the security officers, it was uh, maybe the most dangerous thing for a, for a communist regime uh, in the post-Stalin era. And I stress this because in most of the new theories of the totalitarian regime, a mass terror is somehow of secondary importance. It was important for Brzezinski, for people who knew it. And I think uh, uh, terror, and uh, more specifically fear, being afraid of reprisals was important, not so much in forcing people to do something, but in preventing them from trying things which are not necessarily illegal, but they didn't know it. So the decrease of terror after Stalin's death opened the room for this experimentation. Mm -hmm. And the communist re regime surprisingly proved very unflexible to, you know, even you know, in a, in a centralized bureaucracy, it takes time. A local officer must report to headquarters. They have to discuss it, and then they send it back. We accept it, or we don't accept it. And in the meantime, you have five other behaviors. So that was usually behind it. And from time to time, they try to clamp down. Yes, they tried. But again, a few years later, they had reasons to relax. Usually, it was a part of the town, improving relations with Germany or with the United States or with any other country. And since late 1970s, it was a deliberate policy to let Poles make money abroad, because Poland was practically bankrupt and needed hard currency. So I was tolerated when I went back to Poland with my dollars, because I put my dollars in a state-owned bank at a very good interest rate, I must say. <laughs> they needed it. So there were. Uh, well, the situation was difficult. They didn't like it, but they needed it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Poland was rather unique. You know, citizens of Romania couldn't go abroad this way. But I used the example of transnational mobility, this for-profit mobility, as a case. Because there were other behaviors, economically motivated, that were transgressive, outside of the script. My case is good because we have a lot of documents about it. And it started from zero in 1955 and then expanded into millions. But I think the similar patterns of you know, pioneers, then how it developed, how it, how it expands, you can find in other uh, behaviors. For a second point, um, I will go to, uh, back to what I mentioned in the beginning. In the beginning, I mentioned Czesław Miłosz giving the memorial lecture in the year 2000. And I mentioned his book, The Captive Mind. In this captive mind, uh, there is a, f a very famous concept of his. He, he calls it Ketman. Uh, Ketman is uh, something he takes from um, early Muslimhood in Persia, actually. It comes to him through Gobineau, the French uh, writer Gobineau. Gobineau uh, writes about uh, Ketman. The, this history is not so very important and it might even be false. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Miwash calls it Ketman. And Ketman is, uh, for example, a lip prayer. You pray, you seem to keep the rules, but you don't believe it innerly. Yeah? You just pretend to play a role. Uh, so you, you're, innerly, you're innerly distancing yourself from something, but you, you, you somehow uh, keep uh, the, the, the outward uh, um, as if everything, uh, as if, if you believed in it. 
This Catman is a very central con concept to his, to, to his book. And the, the question brings me back to your main metaphor of rules and roles. Um, you speak about it mainly in economic terms. So you can say there is somebody who has a role as doing this or that. He can also, she can also go to the black market, sell something and become much richer with a second job or with a second role than actually with the, with the first role. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, somehow you yourself and your father it was a quite striking e example, right? So you can play that second role and economically that makes maybe good sense. But I then I have a question, can one really only speak about it in terms of economics. And Miwash, for me, is the example that uh, one has to see it also differently, or he at least tries to see it differently. And for him, it is very much an intellectual thing. And he would say, people who are practicing this Ketman, who try to be different people, I mean, you can say this is a strategy of survival, yes, but it is also a strategy of hypocrisy. And it is also a strategy that, in the end, might might really drive you crazy. Maybe you be, can become you. You can see yourself like a Nietzschean hero, <laughs> who is playing different roles masterly simultaneously. But it might drive you a bit crazy in the end. Uh, what, what? How do? You, how do you see this? How? How? How about the the influx of let's say intellectual um, elements to roles and rules? Miłosz was interested in the life of the mind, um, and my perspective is behavioral. I really don't care what people think. I'm interested in what they do. Well, I, I'm interested in what they think. But even when they declare something, the motivation may be different. But behavior... This is careful. Yes. But when you see the, the behavior, you know, when you see something walking like a duck and ducking like a duck, it probably is a duck. So you can parallelly behave differently in different sceneries. We do it every day. We behave differently in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a public meeting than our kitchen, playing with our kids or talking to our, our mother. So this is not unusual. I think the question is, are these roles contradictory? As long as they are not contradictory, it's OK. But when they are contradictory, not everyone has the capacity for Ketman. It takes training. Mm. So I think uh, it was getting increasingly difficult for many people to maintain it. It's easier, it takes less energy to be consistent in your life. Uh, but through extended periods, as long as there is no obvious contradiction, you can play a variety of very different roles. Ivan was first. <laughs> Wait for the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. And here's my question, which is very much about the famous slogan in the grocery. And you imagine this person that are traveling and they're trading and they're doing this and that. Are they going to read it the same way in the 1980s, in the way it was read in the 1970s when Havel did it? Because uh, remembering part of this period, somebody putting this workers unite can be perceived as a mockery. There was a famous slogan in Bulgaria, Ronald Reagan, the enemy number one of the Tutraka municipality. <laughs> if you're going to put it there, this is not exactly clear, particularly taking slogans from the 1950s and putting in a grocery 20 years later is basically much more a sign that you're not taking the regime seriously. And I do believe that this type of a crossing borders as a physical exercise was changing also the way you're reading the loyalty or disloyalty. And certain things that looks as expression of loyalty in the 1970s looks much more subversive in the 1980s. So this was my question. Well, this is, you know, changing the interpretation of the context. You change the frame. And, you know, this is the f famous Toas theorem that uh, what people think, even if they are wrong, is important because they follow the way of thinking. This is, the, this is the reality of, of imagination. Uh, 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 Jeff Goldfarb gives another example of a, of a Polish theater. On one day, they were filming a queue. They made a queue in front of a shop. And the police officer came and asked him, what are you doing? Oh, we're making a film. So what he has understanding was the film was approved by someone. They can make the film. So they made the police officer a part of the happening of an enactment of a line in front of a shop. And that was the irony of it. Well, 
not all the people have the sense, same sense of humor. So sometimes you can, can, can be, can be uh, punished, but certainly for a, 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 a Polish worker member of the Solidarity Movement going to Czechoslovakia in the mid-1980s, the slogan, workers of the world unite, had a different meaning than to the Greengrosser. Uh, but the Greengrosser didn't know it, and the Polish worker didn't know what the Greengrosser was thinking about it. And I think this is, this is the role of Havel and Koronia and others, to let them speak and find out what is the meaning of, of, the, of the slogan. But irony, irony is the weapon of the weak, certainly. Thank you, sir. I think it's a very you know, wonderful lecture. And uh, I would like to ask, like, I mean, it's my, in context of Nepal, that you know, uh, we get almost 30% of GDP comes from the remittance, from the migrant workers. And uh, large number of migrant workers are in Gulf and Southeast uh, East Asia, and some of them are also coming in Europe also. So, how do we see their role, particularly uh, in terms of promoting the you know uh, establi uh, uh, promoting uh, democratic institutions, values? Uh, we felt that the you know in last elections there was some kind of you know uh, 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 social media p penetrations and migrant workers also have their different roles, right? They are fathers, they are also you know, taking care of the families and others. So, but their you know, uh, uh, ideas of supporting the populist uh, leaders, uh, we felt a little bit challenging in terms of getting their voting, voting rights and others also. How do you, do you see their roles in, in terms of the uh, migrant workers uh, to you know, uh, promote the you know, democratic uh, values or democrat uh, democracy uh, in, in, in the present context? Well, I, I believe that, especially when you think about the migrant workers in the segmented labor markets, performing d dirty, difficult, dangerous jobs and sometimes uh, in grey markets, we have large labour grey markets and black markets in Europe, and they have a similar role like the black and grey markets in the communist regimes. You have the dominant institution of the legal market economy, which is regulated, and you have protection, and you have insurance, and so on, but you have millions of people who have no insurance, they are not protected, and they have in precarious position. And I think it's, it's similar, so maybe no socio-economic regime exists without a shadow. The question is how big the shadow is. And clearly, the shadow has grown since the 1980s, especially. And uh, with the passing of time, it trans the, 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 the socio-economic reality of individuals who are not united in any trade union of illegal migrant workers, of semi-illegal migrant workers, translates into a, a, a political question. So you, you have mentioned how the members of the dominant group, those who are protected, who are citizens, who have uh, uh, rights of employment, may, may react to the, this. But it's a question on, on, the, on the both sides. Uh, you know, I, I, as I, I say it, as a former illegal waiter in New York City, you know, I was hiding in the refrigerator when the labor inspection came to the restaurant. So that was, this is a good beginning for migration research, I think, <laughs> to see it from this, this perspective. In the center of the, the, the capital of the capitalist world, New York, there was a refrigerator and I was inside with two Mexicans. Uh, I didn't think at the time workers of the world unite, but that was the situation, I think, you know, me and Tom. <laughs> Mexicans. You know, today I can go to the United States and work almost legally as, as, as a scholar. But I think it's, it is a challenge, not as big as it was for the communist regime, because the communist regime was rigid. And it had this tendency and ambition to etatize everything. But I think it's, a, it's a, of comparable nature, the problem of, of labor migrants today. Will you go ahead? Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, more maybe basic or fundamental things and about the, your use of the notions of power and politics because you um, talked a lot about uh, individual strategies of dealing with 
difficult uh, political regimes, but I wonder how do you, do you really see politics also as performed, you refer to Goffman uh, and others, as performed by individuals in more mundane settings? Uh, you mentioned gossip and if we think about gossip as a weapon of the week or political gossip as political uh, by Besnier, we can also see that gossip used to be a very powerful instrument and tactic for people to, to navigate the world uh, and to actually counteract uh, the, uh, the situations where they were in unequal relations of power. So I wonder how you operationalize that kind of politics, which doesn't have to do with the uh, cabinets or with the offices and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so how do you see the individual agency there? And at the same time, yeah, I guess it relates to power. So could you please elaborate on these two concepts? Thank you. Well, I think I understand that your question is basically between where is the border between the ag individual agency and power of an individual. My favorite definition of, of power is a definition by uh, Vinicius Naroyek, a Polish sociologist, who said power is the capacity to act through other people. That means making other people do what you would like to do. So uh, the examples I have given were about expanding the agency of individuals. But when they were using the social capital, here you have this blurred border between individual agency and the power of individuals. Because if I have a cousin who, out of a feeling of his moral obligation, will do something for me, or I have a friend who, because of a reciprocity, and especially you, you, you have beautiful analysis about communist and post-communist Russia by Lednev, when this friendship is, is not, it's a profitable friendship. The distinction between friendship and business partnership is blurred. But uh, uh, this is exactly when you have more than individual agency. The agency has the capacity to make change, but then you have the capacity to make change using other people. For any reason, they are ready to, 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 to do what you are asking them to do. So I believe that every person has some power in this sense. Yes? It's a micro thing, of course. Being a general of an army gives you much more power than being an individual who has a brother-in-law somewhere. But uh, this is why the capacity to multiply this micropower of individuals other, under certain circumstances is highly consequential. So as a single, you know, relations between me and my cousin is inconsequential, a single act is, is inconsequential, but if a million people do it with their cousins and neighbors and friends, it is. And uh, it is when the acts have a similar direction. And I haven't mentioned it. When I think about why the communist states had such problems in adapting these desires of people, I think at the bottom of it is discrepancy between values, between what people cherish, what people find valuable, and what the leaders of the regime find valuable. To a certain point, there was a lot of overlap between the value sets, like peace, protecting you from German invasion, cheap housing, and you know, full employment, was, were values shared by the Communist Party leaders and the mass of the population. But then, along the urbanization and growing education and the consumer culture, you know, the poisonous consumer culture coming from the West, it started to diverge increasingly. So I think at the bottom you have this value, not only discrepancy, but divergence of values, and which makes many people, without communicating with each other, doing something outside of the script into a direction. And that was the beginning of the solidarity movement, basically. So I have seen two more hands. I suggest we'll take them together. Um, um, we have first uh, Jan, and then I suggest, Michael, you will have the last question for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I'll make it very short then. Um, I'm interested in the relation of the Havel's essay with which you framed your lecture 
and uh, the idea of agency, let's say, I'll make it very short. Does, you know, being a, an agent of capitalist market make you a person living in truth? To make it really short, yeah, um, I'll pass the microphone. Uh, thank you. I am actually connecting uh, in a way to the same same question. Uh, there was a debate. Tarek, thank you for for the lecture. I mean, I enjoyed it as always. Uh, your performances. There was a debate between Havel and Klaus in the 1990s, iconic one in in, in Czech politics uh, uh, around the role of civil society. Uh, and free citizens, like you know, Klaus was standing for the society of free citizens, uh, pursuing their uh, private economic activity, whereas Havel was obviously uh, uh, preaching the politics of civil society. And Klaus had this historical argument that look, I mean, Charter 77 was nice, but the really important thing was the independent economic activities of the people. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that you like to find yourself very close to, to, to Klaus' uh, argument in this sense. But I would like to challenge you uh, in a similar similar direction. Uh, you uh, uh, and maybe could you, could you elaborate a little bit more on this politics of the small thing? What does it mean? What the politics in it means, right? Uh, you are connecting to uh, Jeffrey Jeffrey Goldfarb. I don't know th this book, but knowing his other stuff, I think that I su I suspect he did not mean way how you are interpreting him. Uh, we know that you know uh, you are quoting Havel. Havel has this reference to Masaryk and Petit work, right? Drobná mm práce. -hmm. Uh, uh, there is, of course, a uh, lot of Kuroins and others uh, references to Práca u Zakvadov, Práca Organičná. This all is, uh, uh, of course, Petit work that is, however, done in the interest of the community. There is a civic spirit, right? Even sometimes I, I I, I understand it's a Republican spirit for the rest publica. We are doing it, and this is not. By, you said that you know they are not mentioning very much the economic activities. I think this is not. This is not by chance that they are not mentioning it because they see these private activities as another way of conformity with the regime. So this is this is why they don't like it. And there is a very strong anti-consumerist uh, aspect in all of these writings in Havel, and particularly right. So this is. I think this is not by chance. So I would like to challenge you on this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see it as a challenge. This is actually what I said, or what I intended to say, maybe not clearly enough. Is I started with Havel, and then I extended this perspective into things which were not intentionally uh, to change the political scene. They weren't. They were rather to avoid it. And by answering to the first, it's a very good question. Of course, you can keep lying and make money. However, you know, I'm against kind of a zero-one choices, because you can live in truth and still lie to your wife. You can stop putting the slogan on the, in the window of your grocery shop, <laughs> right? But, keep, but you, you don't live completely in truth. So I, 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 I would like to avoid this situation where you would be 100% in lie and 100% in truth. It may be 73%, maybe 75%, but it's still better. However, however, when you stop following the official lies, it's a zero to one dilemma because they see it and you lose your position and you're no longer in. So I think this, you can pri privately lie, but w with the party, you follow or not. So I think in this sense, there was a, there was a, 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 a distinction. Yes, I don't know. Why exactly Havel? But Havel mentions that you may, in various ways, live this life in, in lies. And he mentions plastic people of the universe who had no political ambitions. They wanted to play the music they loved. No idea of, you know, democratic Czechoslovakia behind it. So uh, there is a desire for uh, economic independence in having earnings outside of a s s socialist economy? Is it about freedom? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I know that dictatorship and market economy can exist. And even more in the late 1980s, uh, in the Polish Communist Party headquarters, there was an idea, let's make some room for private business and channel the oppositional activity of these young, rebellious people into business which basically was, the f let's follow the Chinese way. 
they didn't have enough time, they started. It turned out that not the leaders of the opposition moved, but the members of the party. <laughs> So, you know, they, they, they were unexpected consequences of the strategy of shifting the, the activity from the political scene into another scene. It, it changed the behavior, but not of the, of the right people. And the third point to make it more complex, there is a nice book. The title is The Patriotic Business. This is a book about underground publishing in Poland, which was liberal, I mean, for freedom. It was patriotic, and it was a business. And it could operate because it was a very sound business. There was an insurance company for underground publishers in Warsaw. If you, if you lost your machines, you could be compensated and so on. So I think there is no contradiction. I mean, making the dilemma between civil society and market economies, like the dilemma, should we uh, wash hands or legs? Maybe we should wash both. You know, it's, it's good to have personal independence, not to have the state as the only employer in the country. I think you cannot be free in a country where there is only one employer. And is it Coca-Cola or the Communist Party is secondary? So I think there is a relation between the two, but I, I wouldn't put it you know, as a dilemma, this or that. Darius, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this. <laughs> powerful argument about the uh, agency of the powerless. Uh, it, was, it was great uh, listening to you tonight. Uh, um, um, it was a great experience. Feel all of you, please feel invited uh, for our reception downstairs now. Join us uh, to the cafeteria. Uh, we have some, for this special occasion, some extended wine and cheese um, to, today. Please join us for that and dis dis uh, continue the discussion downstairs. And uh, we should not end this without a big final applause for Darius. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.